grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We say it, we say it, don't we? We say it every week. Um, and I, I've kind of been thinking about the words that we say and how they become ritual. I don't know about you, but, but uh, I, I kind of have to repent quite often of a false pride of being a Baptist. Um, Because I think, well, we're not bound to any ritual. We're not tied to any liturgy. And then we find ourselves doing the same things in the same order and saying the same words. So we are tied to ritual and order and liturgy. And I find myself kind of repenting of my arrogance and my pride that says, oh, we don't have to do that. We're better than that. But I've been really thinking about the words that we say. Because these words become so well known to us that actually we can forget the meaning of them. We can just say them. And, and um, it, it can almost be like, um, almost ready, steady, go, kettles on. You know, it's that kind of thing. We say the words of the grace, off for a cup of tea. And I was thinking, so, so what, what, what do these words actually mean? When we say the words of the grace, to another, what are we actually asking God to bless each other with? What, what are we actually saying? And the words were just up there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. And and we pray that for one another. And I wondered actually if we paid attention to that blessing, and if we know what it means. And if you do, fantastic. Uh, If you don't, hopefully it will be a little bit of an education. And if you do, well, what a wonderful reminder of the grace of God. So the idea is that over the next three weeks, we're going to look at this blessing this single little blessing, and we're going to break it down into three parts. So this week, I want us to think about what on earth do we mean when we bless each other with the words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all forevermore. What does that grace look like, and what does it mean? So did you know that the the, the words of the grace in full like that appears at the end of 2 Corinthians, the final chapter? And depending on which version you're reading, it's either recorded as verse 13 or verse 14. And it was written at the end of the letter to the church at Corinth by the Apostle Paul. And uh, if we read the whole of of the the books, the letters to the Corinthians, uh, we hear that Paul has some harsh words to say to the church at Corinth. They have been up to all sorts of things. And um, I am planning to spend some time either later in this year, possibly at the beginning of next year, looking in some detail at the letters that Paul writes there. But seriously, when people sort of say to me, and again with this false air of pomposity almost surrounding it, um, uh, I wish the church today was more like the New Testament church as it was founded you know, as if that was an ideal time, I quite often point them to the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians to see what Paul had to say to this ideal New Testament church of the time. But Paul is writing these letters, he's writing a letter to a seriously mixed up church, they're having real problems, and he does in the body of the letter speak strongly to them, but he begins his letter and he ends his letter with words of grace and blessing asking God to pour out his grace over them, that it would transform who they are as individuals and as a church community. And many of us have sat in sermons over the years and have heard sermons on grace. And there's one acronym that seems to be repeated again and again. Shall we say it together? Who knows the acronym for grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. We've heard it so often. We know this stuff. And it's a, I just find that acronym a, a wonderful way to help us remember what grace means. God's riches at Christ's expense. So God's riches, what are they? I've just come up with a little list. I thought about setting you off to get you shouting out about what God's riches are, but I um, forgot to get the whiteboard out. So I'll just tell you my list. You know, you try and be organised. You live next door now. Should be easy. Not a chance. So, <laughs> so these were some of the things that I came up with. Forgiveness from sin. Life instead of death. Freedom instead of slavery to sin. Life in all its fullness 
here and now. That happy certainty of glory, our ultimate reward. The Holy Spirit living inside each one of us. Being a child of God and being a part of God's earthly family. And access to God through prayer. Now, you could probably come up with a hundred other things. If we had the whiteboard, I'd allow you to. But, you know, these were just a few things that I came up with. That I consider God's riches to me, to us, as followers of Jesus. But all of these things are God's free gift. They're God's free gift to us as Christians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9 says this. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So it's by grace that we've been saved. It's by grace that Roy has been saved. It is by grace that God is working in the lives of all of those people in the box and so many, many more. Uh, It's the grace of God. It's not our own merit. It's not because we deserve it. It's not because we've put in the right amount of prayer. God's not a holy uh, vending machine. We say the right words and out pops the result at the bottom. It is all grace. Not on our own merit, not because we deserve it, because we don't, we can't. And yet we totally struggle with the concept of that. We're not used to receiving free gifts, are we? Or at least not that anyone's there are any good. Or we think there's a catch, you know? The saying is, if something looks too good to be true, it usually is. We've seen all the offers, haven't we? Get a free Parker pen if you sign up to a year's insurance policy. Get a month free trial of something. I signed up about four years ago to a free trial of Netflix. Can't figure out how to turn it off. Been paying for it ever since. Um, Do you remember the letters that you used to get? They seem to have stopped a bit now. Those old Reader's Digest letters. something. Dear Mrs. Love, you are a guaranteed winner. You could be the winner of our £10,000 prize draw. To find out what you have won, please call this number. Calls cost £5 per minute, minimum call duration, 10 minutes. Don't think I'll be worrying. There's always a catch. There's always a catch. In life, we have been conditioned to this idea that there is always a catch. And we look for the catch. So when we're told salvation is a free gift of God... We want to know where the catch is. But God, in his amazing grace, he has saved us through the cross of Jesus Christ. But like any gift, we have to receive it. Um, A couple of Christmases ago, a couple of Christmases ago, I had one of the most wonderful surprises. Um, I'm just going to reveal... A little bit more of how sad I am right now, but my boys know how much I enjoy playing video games. Okay, that, uh, they say confession is good for you. I've had, I've grown up with boys. You know, I've had young boys. If you can't beat them, join them. I love football. I love video games. It's just one of those things. And they knew that my old Xbox 360 had reached the end of its life. It was broken. And on Christmas Day, in walked my Sam with this giant sack tied up with ribbons and he put it in front of me and he said happy Christmas mum this is from all of us and all of the boys all of my boys had saved up and they bought me an Xbox one and my first reaction was that is ridiculous it's far too much it's far too big it's far too expensive I can't possibly take it Could you have imagined my boy's reaction if I'd said that? If I'd said, thanks, but but no thanks. And yet, so many people, that's what we say to God. Christ has died for them and Christ has died for us so that we can live in the glorious riches of God that we talked about at the start, but we say and they say, thanks, Jesus, but no thanks. It's too big, it's too much. We don't deserve that. And God says, "Um, yeah, that's the point. 
It has been done. It has been purchased. Christ died on the cross so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be in relationship with God to live life in all its fullness right now. God has brought us into a new life with Christ. We share in his resurrection life. We share in his eternal life. That is grace. That's the free gift of God. It's done. The gift is wrapped and under the tree. Will we receive it? And we have to accept this free gift of God because we can never earn it. And we can never deserve the blessings that God gives to us every single day. I came across this phrase this week. Actually, I nicked it absolutely entirety from my friend Peter, the guy who preached at my induction. He said, when we were having a conversation about grace, and he says, grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. It's like the thief on the cross next to Jesus. In Luke 23, verse 39 to 43, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save us and save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is grace. The pure, unmerited favor of God. But so many of us, even those of us who are saved, who are meant to be living in this grace, we we say it can't be that simple. What are the rules, we say? There must be rules. Um, Have you heard of Betty Crocker? Betty Crocker, the cake mix people. Um, Well, Betty Crocker, this company, they invented cake mix in a box. So no weighing, no measuring. All you had to do was tip the ingredients from the box into a mixing bowl and add a little bit of water. Put it in the oven and Bob's your uncle. You have a lovely cake. Do you know the cake mix didn't sell? The company nearly went out of business. People couldn't get their heads around the fact that it was so easy, that you just add water, simple. Do you know what the company did? They took out the powdered egg and they made it so that you have to add eggs and water and a little bit of oil now. And the cake mixes started to sell. And now they are the biggest manufacturer of cake mix in the whole world. See, because human beings, we we try and earn things. We needed to earn the cake. To add water was too easy. And so we feel that we need to earn God's favour. And so we create rules, don't we? We create these rules. uh, To live in God's grace, we say, you need to be at church every Sunday without fail. Well, no, you don't. Being at church is great, Please don't mishear that. I'm not saying you don't have to come off, you go find a beach somewhere and enjoy yourself. You know, being at church is great. It allows us to focus on God. It allows us to put ourselves in that place where we can focus on him and receive from him with no other distractions. But we aren't here, I hope we're not here, because it's the rules. I hope we're here because we're in relationship with God. It's the same for praying and reading the Bible. We don't sort of earn some holy brownie points by setting aside a quiet time each day to read and pray. Instead, we spend time with God, reading his word and praying and in conversation with him because we want to spend time with him. Just like I love spending time with Adrian and the boys. You know, we don't have a rule that says at this time, at this date, you will spend time with me. We spend time together because we want our relationship to be strong. See the difference? A relationship rather than rules and regulations. Because you see, the problem with rules and regulations 
Uh, we start wanting others to live by our rules. So we say, if you're going to come to church, then you have to dress in a certain way. You have to look a certain way. Uh, you have to eat a certain way. You have to use a certain language. Can you see how we start putting these rules into place almost unconsciously? And the problem is when we start wanting others to live by our rules, um, we start telling people how they need to be before God will accept them. And actually, God's grace is for everyone, no matter of colour, of creed, of rich or poor, uh, of gay or straight or honest or, you know, or criminal. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives, that is grace. That's the sheer amazing grace of God. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. And God's grace is for you, whoever you are, and whatever you're going through. God's grace is for you. Paul spends a long time all the way through the New Testament. I did start off um, trying to do a, uh, a word search, you know, through looking for grace in the New Testament so I could bring you uh, illustrations of grace, I would have just literally read the whole New Testament, especially Paul's writings, because he spends all the way through the New Testament teaching people the difference between the law and grace. We used to live under the law. We had a list of rules and regulations to follow. Now we live in the grace of God. There are no rules. It doesn't mean to say you can go and break all the rules of the law, but we live under grace. We live in relationship. That's not to say that we can do what we like, but we live as people in relationship with a loving saviour. And living in the grace of God is an ongoing process, isn't it? We have all been saved. Many of us can point to a day, a time, a moment uh, when we gave our lives to the Lord. Others have that story of sort of walking gently and then all of a sudden realizing that for the last little while they have been journeying with Jesus. But it's an ongoing process. We have been saved. We are being saved. And ultimately, on that day, we will be saved. It's an ongoing process. See, that one event 2,000 years ago opened the way of salvation. And all who believe and trust are saved. But the grace of God is continually being poured into our lives and transforming us. Continuing daily that work of salvation. You're different today than on the day you were saved. Aren't you? I hope so. You're different today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is at work in you, has been at work in you, transforming you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You are different today than you were yesterday, and you will be different tomorrow because of the inworking grace of God. That's a phrase I often use, actually, uh, putting ourselves in the place of grace. And it's like consciously putting yourself in the place where you are deliberately meeting with God and allowing him to speak into your life. That's why we pray, isn't it? That's why we pray. Because as we pray, we see God at work, our faith grows, we encounter God, and we are transformed, we are changed, we are different. And God's grace is what helps us to get through the day each day. There's a song, I love it, it says, Your grace is enough, more than I need. Your grace is enough, God. Because I need to know the grace of God every day. I need to know the forgiveness of God as much today as I did on that day when I was saved. I need to know the love of God today as much as I did on the day that I was saved. I need to know the acceptance of God as much today as I did on the day that I was saved. I need the grace of God. And for me, you know that, that when we say the words 
of the grace at, at, at the end. When we bless each other with those words, what I'm asking God to do for you when I, I pray it, see, I want you to know and experience the grace of God every day, not to worry about tomorrow, but to rely on the grace of God, the sheer undeserved favor of our Father to get you through today with all of its trials and with all of its joys, with all of its difficulties and with all of its celebrations. And I pray that as you allow God to work in your life by the power of his Holy Spirit, you will be transformed. That you will allow the saving grace of God to continue working in your life, making you more and more and more like Jesus. And that's what I pray for me too. That's what I pray for me too. You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. But daily we need God and his grace to lead us forward, to forgive us, to show us his mercy, to knock off all of our rough edges and to transform us more and more into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Grace says there's nothing that you can do to earn God's favor. He loves you more than you can ever understand. Even before you loved him, he sent his son to die for you. And grace says there is nothing that you can do to stop God from loving you. Some of us need to hear that this morning. There is nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he does. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less than he does. That is grace. It doesn't matter how much you mess up, how much you get it wrong, God never stops loving you. Think about that one person that you think wouldn't be welcome in this church or in any church. That person, the outcast, the drunk, whoever it is, the addict. God loves them so very, very, very much that he sent his son to die for them so that they could receive his eternal life. And the challenge to us, the challenge to us as recipients of God's grace, as, as, as followers of Jesus, as grace-filled people, is to live in that grace and to live that grace out. As we have been forgiven, so we should forgive. As we are loved, so we should love. As we are accepted, so we should accept others it's easy to say it's incredibly difficult to live out when I've been wronged or let down my pride says I want an apology grace says forgive anyway even when people are not sorry even when people don't deserve forgiveness forgive them anyway I found this poem it's attributed to Mother Teresa. It was found on the wall of her home. And for me, this epitomizes what it means to live a grace-filled life. It says this, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God it was never between you and them anyway. 
And so, this morning I say to you in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive, be kind, succeed, be honest and sincere, create, be happy, do good and love. Forgive. And if you want to put everything into perspective, there's a wonderful old song. You can't beat some of the wonderful old songs, can you? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Wonderful. Praise Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all evermore. Amen.